Welcome to the Business Scholarship Podcast, a place for interdisciplinary conversations in the broad world of business research. My name is Andrew Jennings, and it's my pleasure to be your host. If you like what you hear today, please subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. Plus, leave a rating and let other people know about the show, too. And if you have ideas for the show, please let me know. My email address is andrew at andrewkjennings.com, and I look forward to hearing from you. All right, time for the episode. Our guest today is Christine Abley, Assistant Professor of Law at New England Law, Boston. We'll be discussing her new book, The Russia Sanctions, The Economic Response to Russia's Invasion of Ukraine. I'll have a link to the book's webpage in the show notes for the episode. Christine, welcome back to the Business Scholarship Podcast. Thanks so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Christine, I think it's really incredible that you were able to put a book like this together in a fairly short amount of time on a really critical geopolitical issue of world economics and peace and security, a critical issue here in America's domestic politics. And to put this book together while history is still developing, this is recent history, but it's also current history. Even though it is fairly recent history, I wondered if you could give us some background on the events that led up to the subject of this book, which is U.S. and world sanctions against Russia and the Russian economy. Could you give us perhaps a high-level background of the state of play in early 2022 as Russia was massing on the borders of Ukraine and how the U.S. and global sanctions, economic sanctions, responded to the eventual invasion uh, by Russia of Ukraine. Perhaps maybe give us a, a little bit of a play-by-play of, of what happened and how these sanctions developed and were unveiled by the U.S. and its, its global partners. Certainly. So there had been some indication prior to the 2022 invasion of Ukraine by Russia of Russian intentions, of specifically of Putin's intentions toward Ukraine. And certainly the greatest indicator of that was the Russian invasion of Crimea earlier in the decade. And as well, Putin's rhetoric signaled that he saw Ukraine as an integral part of the Russian state. And certainly there were indications of the coming invasion. We also saw Russian involvement in the Donetsk and Luhansk regions. So these were some clear indications that Russia would perhaps launch a general invasion of Ukraine at some point in the future. What we also saw was Russia taking certain steps to insulate itself from the possibility of sanctions from the United States, the European Union, and other sanctioning powers were it to launch a general invasion of Ukraine and the sanctioning powers to respond with sanctions. For example, Russia, we saw some movement towards the reduction of dollars in Russian held reserves. Certainly, though, there was not a complete insulation of Russia towards the possibility of sanctions, such a, an insulation, I would argue, was not possible given the extent to which the sanctioning nations are integral to the world economy. And so we saw both these economic factors and certainly military factors as well pointing towards an eventual invasion of Ukraine. And that's, in fact, what we saw in February 2022. Russia moved into the Donetsk and Luhansk regions of Ukraine first, and then later that same week launched a general invasion of Ukraine. Could you talk a little bit about the sanctions that the U.S. and other powers around the world imposed on Russia in response to its invasion in Ukraine? How were these sanctions par for the course in terms of how economic sanctions are used traditionally? How were these sanctions perhaps a bit different? And what were the intended ends of the U.S. and other countries around the world in imposing these sanctions in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine? That first week of the Russian invasion of Ukraine saw the imposition of massive numbers of sanctions levied against targets in Russia or supporting the Russian military effort. Sanctions generally come in two different categories. There are comprehensive sanctions, which broadly prohibit economic transactions with a particular geographic region. And then there's also targeted or smart sanctions, which are levied against individual targets rather than against a geographic region as a whole. So what we saw in the first week 
following Russia's invasion of Ukraine were comprehensive sanctions that were enacted, but only with respect to the Donetsk and the Luhansk regions of Ukraine. And this was quite similar to those sanctions which had been enacted with respect to the region of Crimea after Russia's invasion of Crimea. Right. So that was similar, these comprehensive sanctions, but were very limited in their geographic scope. Those were proportional to Russia's invasion of those particular regions, and they were similar to sanctions that had been enacted in the past. The sanctions which followed later that week, following Russia's general invasion of Ukraine, rather than its move into the Donetsk and Luhansk regions, were quite different. So these were not comprehensive in nature, but Despite that, the targeted sanctions that were enacted following the general invasion were much more sweeping in nature. Uh, And that's because these targeted sanctions, even though they were levied against individual targets, right, they were placed on individual targets, they were placed on a massive number of targets in a variety of industries very important to Russia. For example, the Russian financial sector was one sector that was heavily affected by the imposition of sanctions, both in that initial sanctions response and in the subsequent rounds of sanctions that have followed since then. But the sanctions that were enacted against financial institutions came in different varieties. They were full blocking sanctions, which prohibited any transactions between the selected financial institutions and parties in the sanctioning nations. There was also what's known as correspondent banking sanctions, and those hinder the ability of the sanctioned Russian financial institutions to transact business in the currency of the sanctioning nations. Not all transactions are prohibited, but a very important subset of transactions with the currency of the sanctioning nations are, in fact, hindered. So that's one really important category of sanctions that we observed in that first week. Another category of sanctions that we observed but became more important later or developed later were the sanctions with respect to energy. Because certainly some of the sanctioning nations did immediately prohibit imports of energy supplies from Russia. And Russia is a very important energy supplier globally. So some of the sanctioning nations did prohibit those imports, but often when they did, they were countries that did not already rely heavily on imports of Russian energy supplies like oil and natural gas. For example, the United States was quick to enact a ban on Russian energy supplies, but did not rely heavily on those supplies pre-invasion. The EU, in contrast, only later in 2022 agreed to a ban on the import of Russian oil by sea. And that's because oil supplies were much more important to the EU relative to certain other of the sanctioning nations. So we can speak on that a bit further, but the development of import bans relative to Russian oil supplies and then the price cap mechanism that was designed to improve the effectiveness of that particular measure grew in importance uh, as these measures were developed. Certainly, there were a variety of other types of sanctions that were enacted as well. Some of the most publicized sanctions were those against oligarchs, right? Individuals, quite wealthy individuals within Russia who it's thought lend significant support to Putin and thus to Putin's war effort and perhaps are in a position to influence Putin. Sanctions were placed on those individuals and we saw the seizure of yachts and so forth with respect to those particular sanctions. We saw import bans on a number of other products from Russia. We also saw export controls on products going to the Russian military and with respect to certain higher tech products going to Russia generally. So those were certainly key elements of this sanctions response as well. With respect to the financial sanctions, we also saw swift disconnections of selected Russian financial institutions. And SWIFT is the messaging platform 
by which financial institutions message each other in cross-border transactions. And so that, although it didn't prohibit transactions themselves, also worked to hinder the, in a practical manner, the ability of those banks to carry out those transactions. We saw also sanctions on investment into Russia, and we've seen a variety of these sanctions types. And this was just the first stage of the sanctions, right? With the exception of the oil sanctions that I, I mentioned earlier. But since then, we've seen a variety of new sanctions being enacted against Russia, as well as increased enforcement with respect to the sanctions that already exist. As these sanctions were being imposed and discussed before they were imposed, I'm sure there are a lot of different kinds of actors in the room where it happens. There'll be diplomatic experts, there will be treasury officials, defense officials, but I assume there will also be lawyers in the room as well. And you and I are both lawyers, so I'm interested about some of the legal issues that imposing these sanctions might create for the U.S. and for other countries around the world. What is the domestic or the international law of imposing these types of economic sanctions? What type of work might lawyers in this case be doing to make sure that any legal issues are resolved and that these sanctions are imposed consistent with domestic laws and with international law? Generally speaking, each individual sanctioning nation has its own body of law, which authorizes the imposition of sanctions. So the United States certainly sanctions. They're administered by the Office of Foreign Assets Control in the U.S. Department of the Treasury, generally speaking, pursuant to the authority of IEPA. Similarly, there are legislative statutes in other countries, which either have been in place or have been enacted more recently to authorize the imposition of sanctions. In the EU, restrictive measures are coordinated at the union level. So that's something we've seen as well. The imposition of sanctions by the EU in coordination with the United States and the other sanctioning nations. With respect to particular legal issues that have arisen in the context of sanctions, with respect to the sanctioning of oligarchs and so forth, there's arisen some interesting cases about the delisting of oligarchs who may have been made subject to sanctions because sometimes the listing criteria or the rationale for listing is more tenuous than in other circumstances. So one thing we've seen is on the part of OFAC, for example, there's been an increased emphasis on publicizing the means for delisting. We've seen some case law out of the EU relative to de particular sanction targets. So that's very much a developing area of law that's quite interesting. I'd like to talk about the impacts on Russia and on the war in Ukraine from these economic sanctions. What were the short-term impacts on the Russian economy, particularly the Russian war economy and, and perhaps Russia's ability to engage in war in Ukraine? What have been maybe the medium-term effects of these economic sanctions? And of course, the long-term hasn't been written yet, but what are some of the likely possibilities that we might look for? But it's an interesting question because it very much ties into this debate over whether or not sanctions have been effective. The economic data certainly have been mixed, right? And that's partly a function of the fact that when the sanctions were imposed by the sanctioning nations against Russia, when I say sanctioning nations, I do not mean all the other countries of the world besides Russia, right? The sanctioning nations are a group of countries, but a group which does not include large portions of the world. For example, China and India are not sanctioning nations. Much of Africa, South America did not join in the sanctions response. And so the sanctions are necessarily limited by that fact because they cannot completely isolate Russia within the global economy. For those reasons, we've seen some mixed economic data about the impact of the sanctions because they're necessarily limited in their breach because of the relatively limited number of countries that have enacted those sanctions. Certainly very important economies, but by no means is it a universal sanctions response. So we've seen a shifting in trade patterns as a result, where Russia is engaging more in trade with India, China, Turkey, 
Brazil, for example, we've seen a reduction in trade between Russia and the United States, Russia and the United Kingdom, Russia and South Korea. And we've also seen a notable decline in inbound foreign direct investment into Russia as a result of the sanctions. More recently, we've seen significant inflation in Russia, right? And that's due to a variety of causes, not just the sanctions. Because what we've seen is also that Russia has, in fact, been able to even increase its military production in a number of areas, right? And so it, it seems like that's still possible for Russia, certainly, but Russia may be funding its military production at the expense of consumer product. We've certainly seen news stories, for example, the, the high price of eggs due to inflation and so forth in Russia. And so we do see that there are some consumer effects, but certainly Russia is able to pivot and turn towards economic relationships with India and China and other of the non-sanctioning nations to obtain some of the items and engage in transactions with which those transactions with the sanctioning states are no longer feasible. So in addition, what we see in the longer term, perhaps, is that the sanctions may weaken the Russian economy due to the export controls and also the restrictions on investment that have been placed on Russia, right? Certainly the restriction of higher tech items into Russia may affect the development of technology in that country as might investment. But again, it's also going to be a question of how much will Russia be able to substitute from sanctioning nations with inputs and trade with non-sanctioning nations. Another thing we've seen is the further development of a Russian payment system, the Mir payment system, as well as Russian financial institutions are turning towards a Chinese payment system and messaging with Chinese financial institutions as an alternative to the financial infrastructure that is largely controlled by the sanctioning nations. So we see certainly effects with respect to trade, investment, and the financial platforms as well. So there's a debate ongoing about trends of de-dollarization. You'll recall that we just spoke about the sanctions, which restricted the ability of Russian financial institutions either to enter into transactions with banks in sanctioning nations and all parties in sanctioning nations, or restricted their ability to engage in transactions with the sanctioning nations' currencies. And so there is a question over whether the sanctions are accelerating a trend of de-dollarization and encouraging the use of other currencies from non-sanctioning nations globally. Um, so I think that certainly sanctions are not discouraging that trend. They may, in fact, be accelerating that trend, but that's a trend that existed prior to the imposition of sanctions. And certainly um, sanctions are not the only factor that is fueling the trend of de-dollarization. De-dollarization is also unlikely to be complete. De-dollarization, the dollar is a dominant currency, and so it's unlikely that the dollar will move from that position anytime in the short term, I would say. I'd like to go back to early 2022. Let's imagine that you're an advisor to the White House, to the Treasury Department, to the State Department. You're in the room where it happens. And having the benefit of hindsight, knowing what now, what would you have advised President Biden, Treasury Department, et cetera, to do differently on the economic sanctions front? I think that's a really interesting question because I think so much of the sanctions response depends on seeing how Russia responds and then adjusting and creating new sanctions to address those adaptations of Russia, if you will. And so I think certainly while we can say now that some measures are more effective than others, for example, with respect to the imposition of the price cap, we see that the price cap was initially very effective and then became less effective over time. And now more recently has become more effective with increased enforcement. I don't know that I would have ex ante 
been able to or necessarily advise a different sanctions strategy because I think it's also necessary to see the response of Russia and to create new sanctions accordingly. So I think that one thing that the sanctioning powers have done well is to identify new threats to the effectiveness of sanctions and then to devote enforcement resources accordingly. For example, one issue we see is that of transshipment where exports go to Russia via third party countries. And so enforcement now is focusing more on transshipment. Also, we see in the future that there may be more of an imposition of secondary sanctions. So primary sanctions are those that are enacted, for example, against a target who supports the Russian military. But secondary sanctions would be enacted against a party who's one step removed, who lends support, for example, to a party involved with the Russian military or supporting the Russian military. And so these are quite politically sensitive. And so I don't think at the outset the sanctioning nations were keen to impose too many secondary sanctions. I think that they've become more necessary over time. But I think that to start a sanctions response with secondary sanctions would not have been attractive to the sanctioning nations, especially with respect to the EU, who historically has not been in favor of an aggressive use of secondary sanctions. I also think that coordination of the sanctions was key, and that's something that the sanctioning nations did well at the outset of imposing these sanctions. I think that one really notable feature of this sanctions response is the extent to which these are not U.S.-led sanctions, right? They are a coordinated sanctions response. And so here we see the EU as a key partner in the sanctions response, along with the other sanctioning jurisdictions. And so I think that's something that was really important, right? And I think that Deciding on coordinated sanctions measures certainly takes time. It takes the enactment of new legal authorities in other jurisdictions. And I think that is something that I would very much not have wanted to sacrifice at the outset of imposing sanctions. So I think that's something that was done quite well. Over the last few years, what have we learned about economic sanctions from this experience of imposing them in response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine? And are there implications or learnings for that that we'll take to the next global crisis, perhaps? I think that one thing we've seen, again, is the importance of coordinating sanctions among jurisdictions, right? I think that one reason why the sanctions response is so effective is that the United States, the EU, Australia, Japan, Canada, and so forth, they are united in the sanctions response. So while Russia is able to turn to certain of the non-sanctioning nations for economic substitutes, the strength of the sanctions response comes from that level of coordination. And I think that perhaps signals a new era in sanctions and positions where we see the importance and we understand the importance of a multilateral sanctions response. I think one thing that continues to be a concern with respect to the sanctions response and is always a concern with respect to far-reaching sanctions such as these is the humanitarian impact of sanctions on certainly both parties in Russia, but also with respect to third-party nations as well. So we have seen worldwide, especially immediately, post-invasion and post-imposition of sanctions in 2022, right? We certainly saw higher food and energy prices and volatility in those markets. And so that's something I think that the sanctioning nations continue to work to address. There are exemptions in the sanctions regimes and the various frameworks of sanctions law for trade in food and fertilizer. Um, However, overcompliance, overcomplying with sanctions regulations and not entering into those transactions, even though they're authorized, I think certainly is something that is done very often by parties who are subject to the sanctions and who are bound to observe the sanctions. And so I think it's something that both with respect to the sanctions against Russia and with respect to sanctions generally, sanctioning jurisdictions are going to have to grapple with and balance the sanctions response with the humanitarian impacts of sanctions.
What key takeaways would you like listeners to have from this conversation and from the book? And of course, I'll include a link in the the show notes to your publisher website where folks can go and get a copy of the book. Certainly. So I think that I really want to emphasize the very historic nature of the sanctions here, both in terms of the breadth of the sanctions that were implemented, as well as the coordination among nations and the coordination among nations outside of the UN Security Council due to Russia's veto on the Security Council. So here we see the development of a new sort of multilateral sanctions response and also a continuing commitment to enforcement and to the development of new sanctions and new sanctions authorities within the sanctioning countries. I do think that even though sanctions have been used quite frequently by the U.S. in the last half century or so, and especially in recent years, we now see perhaps shift in the position of the EU towards restrictive measures, an increasing willingness by the EU to develop new sanctions measures and to use those measures to their fullest extent. And so I think that we do see a sort of new sanctions era here, perhaps not so much on the part of the U.S., but with respect to the U.S. coordinating with other nations and also with respect to the development and implementation of restrictive measures by the EU. What was your motivation for writing this book? So my practice background prior to academia, I worked in international trade and sanctions. So I was very familiar with the legal mechanism for sanctions, for import restrictions, and for export controls. And so as I was following the imposition of these sanctions against Russian targets, I was very much aware of the historic nature of these sanctions. And I thought that there would be a real use for those interested in the sanctions to having a comprehensive volume which situated the sanctions in their historical context, which provided background on what sanctions and trade restrictions were, and then provided in somewhat of a comprehensive way the story of how the sanctions were imposed against Russia, what those economic effects were in a way that was accessible not just to attorneys or economists, but to those interested in economic affairs or foreign affairs more generally to provide a sort of holistic view of the situation. Our guest today has been Christine Abley, Assistant Professor of Law at New England Law, Boston. We've discussed her new book, The Russia Sanctions, The Economic Response to Russia's Invasion of Ukraine. I'll add a link to the book's webpage in the show notes for the episode. Christine, thank you for joining the Business Scholarship Podcast. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Business Scholarship Podcast. If you like what you heard today, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, rate the show, and let other people know about it too. If you have ideas for future episodes, let me know. My email address is andrew at andrewkjennings.com, and I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm your host, Andrew Jennings. Thank you.